Uh, as always, you can find the notes for this class at theregathering.com slash page slash PFT Hebrew 3. And the past classes are on YouTube, as I mentioned, on the Passion for Truth video channel. So all the beginning and intermediate classes are up there. And uh, very shortly, the advanced classes will be up there, up to date as well. All right. Our topic, our main topic for the day is conjunctions. Uh, a conjunction in Hebrew is called a milat chibur. It's a, a part of speech. Milat chibur means word of connection, and that is abbreviated by a mem, double hash marks followed by a chet, not to be confused with a preposition, okay, which is milat yachas, right, mem, double hash marks, yod. This is a milat chibur. And a conjunction, the function of a conjunction, is to connect two or more words in a sentence together. All right, so a preposition shows the relationship between two words. A conjunction serves to actually connect those words together. And uh, the difference you'll see in a moment. Uh, there are four conjunctions that I wish to elaborate on today. Actually, three I wish to elaborate on. One, you already know. You already know a conjunction. It is the prefix vav. Okay, which means and, that, uh, that is considered a conjunction. It's the most fundamental conjunction, and it serves the most fundamental connection. Okay, and, All right, it's just adding to. Okay, so the vav prefix is a conjunction. Okay, next is bain, bait yud nun. This is not to be confused with um, Bain Beit Nun, okay, which means son. Okay, so this is a homonym, but it is spelled differently. All right, Bain. Bain means between. And we use it just like we use the English between with one exception. In Hebrew, we have to say between before each of the words that define the boundaries of between. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'll show you. If we're speaking of an object, let's say, let's say a horse, okay? So we're in a field and there's a horse. Asus. And we wish to say that the horse is between a man and a tree, or between the man and the tree. Okay. Hasus Bain, the horse is between the man, Haish, Asus bain ha'ish. Okay, and now we can't just say between, can't say hasus bain ha'ish the uh, ha'etz. All right. Instead, we have to use bain before each of the boundaries. Okay, so uvein ha'etz. So if we were to translate this literally word for word, we'd be saying, the horse is between the man and between the tree. Okay, but in translation, we don't say it that way because we don't say it that way in English. We would say the horse is between the man and the tree. But in Hebrew, we have to use bain before each of the items that are defining the boundaries of between. All right, so um, between you and I, We were to say between you and I, bain ata, u bain, ani. Okay, between you and me. But when you're reading it, it looks like between you and between me. 
All right, we're just, bane has to be used before each of the parameters that are defining the boundaries of what the, uh, the word in question is between, okay? So it's used otherwise, just like the English between, it means here's something here, something here, and here's something in the middle. All right, it can also be used in the sense of separating between, okay? So making a distinction between two things, it's used that way in Genesis 1. Um, but it can also mean between in terms of uh, physical location. So that is Bane. All right, our next word is one that you will find very, very frequently, and that is uh, the conjunction asher. And my pen, I believe, is running out here. I'm going to have to revert to black. Okay, so asher. So I've gotten written down here. Asher means that or which. And asher is used to introduce um, conditional clauses. What's a conditional clause? Conditional clause is a clause that introduces a condition. That's not telling you much. Okay, if we speak of a man or the man, ha'ish, we can use asher to introduce conditions or a conditional clause to that man. So the man that... and then pick your condition. The man that is coming. Ha'ish asher ba. Okay. The man that is small. Ha'ish asher katan. Right. The man that is in the house. Ha'ish asher babayit. All right. And then this whole phrase with a conditional clause attached can be a subject or object of a sentence. Okay, it can function uh, as, a, as an entire unit. So we could say the man that is in the house is coming. Ba. Although we would probably put ba at the beginning of the sentence. Okay, so we'd say ba. Let's, let's just go ahead and do that. Okay, ba ha'ish asher ba bayat. The man that is in the house is coming. Okay. So this can introduce an adjective, it can introduce a uh, prepositional phrase, it can introduce a verb, okay. Uh, it can introduce something that is masculine, feminine, singular, or plural, its form does not change. Okay, the form of conjunctions does not change, just like prepositions. Okay, so the woman that is writing would be Ha'isha, the woman. Ha'isha, Asher, okay, is writing, just, uh, just for a refresher on our conjugation, is writing, that's the present tense, all right? The woman is feminine and singular. And our root for to write 
Kaf Tav Beit, right? So the woman that is writing, follow the present tense feminine singular conjugation, and we wind up with Kotevet. Isha Asher Kotevet. The woman that is writing. Okay, so Asher introduces a conditional clause. All right, it further specifies which woman we're talking about. Okay, this woman is specified once by the hey, the woman, instead of just a woman. All right, but it's specified further, okay, and in more direct terms, more specific terms, with whatever follows asher. And asher is used all over the place, just as much as we would use the English term that or which the Hebrew asher is used. In fact, in Exodus 3, um, verse uh, 14, 17, whichever one it is, that uh, translated, I am that I am. Okay, Eheya Asher Eheya. Okay, that. And um, while I do take, take a little issue with the translation, I am, um, the idea is that God is self-existent. Okay, that is, that is no question. Now, actually, when we talk about haya, we'll talk a little more about that verse. Talk about the verb root haya, which is what's being used in that verse. Um, but that's coming later. So, asher means that or which. And our last conjunction is ki. Okay, kaf herik yod, ki. Now, ki can also be translated that, but it doesn't mean that in the same way that asher does. Key always connects words in a causative fashion. And, um, but because is not always a good translation of key, uh, because key works a little differently than the English because. Kind of show you what I'm talking about. Um, Asher introduces conditional clauses, so it further specifies um, something about the, the word that it follows. Okay, so the woman that is writing, it's giving additional information about the woman um, the woman in question. But key is indicating a, a causative relation. So um, it usually links two actions. All right, so something's being done in, and that, that action has a causative relation to the action that follows key. So uh, for example, If I was to say, I heard, I heard, okay, our conjugation, we know that right, Ani Shamang T, okay, Shin Mem Ayan being our root for to hear or to listen. And this is our past tense, first person singular. So shamangti would be I heard. We could also add ani onto this, but we don't have to. But that it would be the accompanying pronoun. Okay, ani shamangti, I heard. That 
and let's say I heard that you were coming. Ba. Right, present tense, so person doesn't matter. Masculine and singular matches ata. Okay, Anisha Mangti ki ata ba. I heard that you are coming. All right, so this that is different from a share. Okay, this isn't uh, this isn't introducing a condition onto me or onto hearing, but it's indicating sort of a loose causal relationship between me hearing and you coming. All right, now it's not an exact causal relationship because I didn't necessarily hear because you were coming. Okay, but I heard that you were coming. It's kind of hard to quantify how the word that is actually functioning um, in that sentence, but there's more, it, it, but key can be used as that in that sense. It has a little more clear causative function when it does mean what we think of as because. All right, so, um, so the example I have at the bottom of the page that talks about key. All right, he is coming. Who ba? Right, he is coming. Why is he coming? Well, he's coming. Ki. Uh, dog. Actually, I had that written the other way. Ki tov. Ha dog. Okay, this is a fish enthusiast. And he is coming because the fish is good, or good is the fish. Okay, so he is coming because the fish is good. So it's indicating a causal relationship. Why is he coming? Because there's good fish. Now, uh, context has to determine which direction key functions in, though. Because this could also mean Key, key can work both ways. So this could also mean um, because he is coming, the fish is good. All right. Now that doesn't tend to make a lot of sense. All right. So context will kind of tell you which which direction it's moving. But key can mean because, or key can mean in order that. All right. So the first thing can be happening because of the second, or the first thing can be happening in order to cause the second and uh, context is what tells you which direction it's functioning. So key is kind of a funny word, all right, but sometimes because is a good translation, sometimes that, and sometimes even for, uh, with the idea being for the purpose of, or in order, in order to, you know, anything of that nature, um, key can function in that capacity. So it's a, it's a funny word, it doesn't have an exact English equivalent, it kind of subs for a number of different English words that have specific senses that are very different. So context is key with, with key. Uh, context is important with key. So, um, but just be aware it has these different uh, functions associated with it and you will see it quite a bit in the scriptures. Um, so you know you're dealing with a causal relationship with key. The question is which direction the cause is, is working. Or if it's a strong cause, like coming because the fish is good, or if it's a weak cause, all right, I heard that you were coming, all right, it's, it's not, I didn't just hear because you were coming, but if you weren't coming, I wouldn't have heard that you were, it's a weak causal relationship, but it still uh, translate as, translates as that, and it still has a loose causal idea. You definitely, though, would not use a share to translate that sentence, all right? because a share introduces a conditional clause, and there's nothing conditional about this sentence. All right, so that is key. The most confusing of the three, I know, but...
Okay, um, another word that I have on the vocabulary list that I'd like to, actually there are three other words that I'd like to point out. One of them is call, kaf lamed, call. Now call is another very common word and it means all or every, depending on if you're talking about uh, multiple objects or just one or objects as a group or objects individually. Okay, so all the horses would be call hasusim. All right, all the houses call habatim. Remember our, regu our irregular plural for houses. Okay. All the horses, all the houses. All right. Call functions just like our English word, all. And there are times where, um, where every is a better, better translation. So if we said call by it, all right, every house. Not all house, but every house. Okay, so that's call. If you look up call in a dictionary, you'll note that no part of speech is given for it. And I'm not entirely certain why that is, but um, it has never failed, no matter what dictionary I've looked up call in, uh, there has not been any part of speech associated with it. Um, to me, I feel that call functions as a preposition, a milat yachas, but uh, I'm sure the, you know, the the actual Hebrew experts that are writing the dictionary have a very good reason for uh, not just calling call a preposition. I don't know what that reason is. Um, in my very limited experience, it usually functions in the capacity of a preposition. Okay, so you can use it in that sense. So that is call, okay, which is not a preposition, but acts very much like one. Um, maybe someday I'll have the answer for that. But uh, until then, I do want to introduce that word because it is, again, very common, especially in the scriptures, but you'll use it all the time in just conversation. Um, okay, two other words are ain and yesh. And you'll notice I have on the vocabulary sheet a new part of speech there. Um, the part of speech that I have abbreviated there is toar hapoal. Okay, so toar hapoal. Abbreviates Tav, double hash mark, Hey, Pei. Tor, as you may recall, is the word for adjective. Okay, but in the case of adjective, Toar Hashem is the full name. Toar means a describer. All right. So Toar Hapol is a describer. Poal is a verb. So Hapoal, the verb. So Toar Hapol means describer of the verb which is an adverb, all right? So adjectives describe nouns and adverbs describe verbs. I'm not gonna get real deep into adverbs today, um, but I did want to introduce these two words, uh, which are technically considered adverbs, all right? But, okay, so tav, double hash mark, hey, pay, that's an adverb. And these two words are considered adverbs, although they function in a in a way that's hard to see how they're really describing a verb, although I suppose uh, technically they are. But yesh means there is, or it can mean there are. And um, 
So this can just be a, a raw statement of existence. Okay, there is something or there are some things. Um, it can also function uh, in a possessive sense. And um, I'll get into that another time, but Yesh is there is. Ain is the one you'll encounter more often. Because Ain means there is not, or there are not. Okay, so if I wish to say there are no horses, Ain Susim. And let's just make it a full sentence. Ain Susim Ba Sade. Okay, there are no horses in the field. All right, so Ain is a word that you will find. Um, Yes, you'll find as well, but um, I suspect you'll actually find Ain more frequently. Because it's not really necessary to state that there is something. You can just talk about something as though it's there. But when you're talking about something that isn't there, you have to sort of conceptualize that by saying there are no whatever. But anyway, philosophy aside, um, Yesh and Ain are considered adverbs, although their function is kind of... The, the verb that they're modifying is invisible, okay? They're modifying the invisible is in the sentence. Um, so it's kind of difficult to see them, them function that way. Other adverbs, it's a lot easier to see how they're working as adverbs. But uh, anyway, yesh and ain, there is and there is not. Okay. All right, and the second order of business for the day after conjunctions is a new uh, conjugation, not to be confused with conjunction. So I want to discuss the features of Gizrat Ayin Vav. Now, if you'll recall our nomenclature for the Gizrot, in our root we have our first, second, and third radicals. Okay, first radical is called the Pe radical, second called the Ion radical, third called the Lamed radical, right? So Ion Vav means that our second radical is a vav. So any root that has this form belongs in category or gizrat i in vav. Okay? Any letter, vav, any other letter is our root. Okay? So if you refer to the chart, You'll see how that works. The, um, the I and Vav in the past tense, the Vav that defines the Gizra always disappears. So in the third person masculine singular, again this is in the past tense, uh, let's, let's give a root to, to show so I'm not drawing boxes with numbers in them and you can see some actual words in practice. Kuf vav mem is a root that means to rise. All right, so we can refer to uh, the sun rising with this word, or to us rising with this as well. It does very frequently apply to the sun. All right, so the third person, masculine singular. Okay, applying the paradigm, and again. On the sheet, the paradigm looks like this. First radical, third radical, okay, with the vowel, and the vav has disappeared. Our second radical is gone. All right, so he rose, 
he rose would be come. Our first radical, the associated vowel, and then our third radical here. So come, he rose. All right, the feminine, comma, she rose. Again, the vav is gone. Third person plural, kamu, they rose. All right. And you'll note that when we shift over to the first and second person, the endings, all the suffixes are the same, all right? This is why I told you uh, to memorize the pattern of the schlamming, because those suffixes just repeat themselves in these other gizrot, all right? It's just uh, other differences earlier in the word that take place in our past tense, all right? So we've got the same suffixes, you'll note the T, in the first person singular, the new, in the first person plural, ta, okay, tem and ten. All right, these are all exactly the same in the I and Vav as they are in the other gives wrote. All right, what changes is earlier in the word. Now the, in the, now the vav drops off in all of these. The difference between the first and second person and then the third person is that the third person uses a comets under the first radical and the first and second persons use a patach. Okay, so the first person singular becomes com with a patach, com t, Okay, the second person, masculine, singular. Kam, again with a patach. Kam, ta, and so on. Okay, so the first and second persons are vocalized with a patach, the third person with a comets, and the endings all stay the same, and the vav disappears in the past tense. Okay, so that is the ayin vav past tense. And in the future tense, an interesting thing happens the vav returns. So, uh, and the main, the main, uh, so the future tense is very predictable. The vav returns and the first radical is vocalized with a comets. Okay, so the first person, singular, we've got our same prefix, our same aleph prefix that you see um, in the shlamim and in the lamed he and in the lamed aleph, all right, in the future tense, first person, singular you'll notice an aleph is always prefixed to that conjugation of verb, all right? But this time it's vocalized with the comets, all right? And then using our same kuf, vav, mem word, okay? So this is future tense, first person singular. So this would mean I will rise. What I'm about to write means I will rise. First radical, our vav returns and it's vocalized with a shuruk and then our third radical mem. So akum, I will rise, all right? Nakum is we will rise. This is plural. Okay, takum. Moving on to our second person, you will rise. Okay, masculine singular. Okay, takumu, you, masculine plural, will rise. All right, and so forth. So the vav disappears, our, our second radical vav and our I and Vav conjugation disappears in the past, and then it reappears in the future. All right, so, but again, 
The suffixes in the past tense are the same, and the prefixes in the future tense are the same, although they are vocalized by a different vowel. All right, and also the uh, suffixes that also appear in the future tense are the same. All right, so that pattern will just keep repeating itself through these conjugations. And that's why it's important to know the basic one, and then you can just adapt it by remembering a few simple things about each of the gizrot. Okay, so if you remember in the ayin vav that the vav disappears in the past but stays there in the future, you're, uh, you're going to be well on track to interpreting these words. All right, so that's the past and the future of gizrot ayin vav. And again, you've got a sheet with that in your notes. Uh, I do want to speak uh, briefly about the present tense of the ayin vav. I don't have a sheet for that in your notes, at least not yet. That will be uh, coming up. But just to show you what the present tense looks like, and I'll use, go ahead and use the, uh, the old box system here to do that. Of course, in the present tense, we don't worry about person. So we've just got masculine, feminine, singular, and plural. So the masculine singular, feminine singular. You'll notice that the vav drops out of these also. And uh, another thing that you will notice is that the masculine singular of the present tense is the same. As, it, it's spelled in the same as the um, third person masculine singular in the past tense. Okay, so. If I was to say, he rose, I would say, who come, okay, he rose. But if I, were, if I was to say, he is rising, okay, so the present tense, I would also say, who come, all right? They would be spelled and vocalized exactly the same way. So that is something worth noting, all right, in the I and Vav conjugation, that your, your, your uh, past tense, your third person past tense, and your present tense are going to look the same. Now in the plural, they do change because if it's past tense, if I was to say they rose, I would say heim kamu or hein kamu because I can use masculine or feminine. But if it's present tense, they are rising, then I would say kamim. Came kamim instead of kamu. So you would be able to differentiate between past and present um, in the plural, but not necessarily in the singular. Kamim, and of course the feminine counterpart is kamot. Okay, so that is the present tense or the active participle uh, for gizrat ayin fav. Now, I have uh, another point I want to make now that I have introduced multiple gizrot is, you know, a, a root that belongs to gizrot ayin vav has a letter, a vav as the second radical, and then a third letter. Suppose, though, that something um, belongs to gizrot lamed aleph, well then it's any two letters followed by an aleph as the third radical. Well, what happens when we have a word that looks like this? What if a word belongs to ayin vav and also to lamed aleph? Which conjugation pattern does it follow? Well, uh, these have to be evaluated on a word-by-word -word basis, but the basic answer is that it then follows both. Now, how can it do that? I want to show, I want to demonstrate how it does that with a particular example. Okay, so this is a word 
that belongs to both Gizrat Ayin Vav and Gizrat Lamed Aleph. And that is a word that we've been using for some time now. Beit Vav Ayin, which means to come. Okay? Beit Vav Ayin means to come. Now, how does this follow both conjugation patterns? Because the vowels and, and uh, things are, are different between uh, Lamed Aleph and Ayin Vav. Well, it follows the basic pattern of Ayin Vav. Okay? So, for our third person, masculine singular, If you look on your I and Vav chart, you'll find the first radical with the comets beneath it. The Vav disappears, and then we've just got our third radical, leaving us with Ba, which would mean he came. Okay, third person, okay, past tense, third person, masculine singular, Ba, he came. All right, no problem there. That's exactly the same as Kam. All right, and in the feminine, Ba'a. Okay, there's the feminine, and then the plural, ba'u. So, so far, absolutely no difference between regular ayin vav and the, and the hybrid ayin vav lamed aleph, right? So, what's the difference? Well, you find the difference in the um, first person and second person in the past tense. Okay. So, in the first person, singular, actually I'll show both roots next to each other so you can see exactly what the difference is. It's very slight. Okay, so, I rose is com T. All right, I came is ba T. All right, so the difference is the Aleph doesn't take a Shva because it doesn't need one. And um, if you remember the regular Lamed Aleph uh, conjugation, it's exactly the same as the Shlamim conjugation, but any time the Aleph would be preceded by a Patach, okay, that Patach changes to a Kametz in Lamed Aleph. And it's no different when it's a hybrid Lamed Aleph Ayin Vav. All right, so you see that normally in the first person, singular. All right, we've got our first radical, patach, second radical, and then our suffix t, okay? And we've got the same thing here, our first radical, third radical, suffix t. The difference is, since our third radical is an aleph, we use a comets vowel right before it, okay? So just like any other uh, Lamed Aleph conjugation, when it's a hybrid Lamed Aleph Ayin Vav, whatever vowel comes before the Aleph changes to a comments. All right, and so on down the line. You can take that whole chart, all right, that gives the, uh, the, the chart that defines Gizrat Ayin Vav, and you can just, if you wish to conjugate the word bow in the past tense, all right, just use that chart and change any patach that comes before an aleph into a comets, and you've got the correct conjugation. All right, so ba ti, all right, the second person, masculine singular. Okay, is ba ta. All right. If we were using kam, we would have used the patach there and wound up with kamta. Okay, again, since we're using Sephardic, the vocalization is exactly the same, but you'll just draw it a little bit differently. So that is how these two forms hybridize into each other. It follows the basic I and Vav pattern, and then it uses the same vowel changes that are used in Lamed Aleph. Right, and so that is how we blend those two in the past tense. In the future tense, uh, they are identical. Uh, they're almost identical, actually. 
uh, except in the future tense, there is actually a vowel change. My, my mistake. So, again, using the first person singular, we've got our olive prefix, first radical bait, our vav returns, and our third radical is an olive. But instead of saying avu, okay, remember akum would mean I will rise. I will come instead of avu is avo. All right, so just change that shuruk to a cholam, and you've got your entire conjugation for the future tense of bo. All right, and the third person, just to show the third person masculine singular, same yod, comets, prefix. The whole root returns. And we use a cholam, so yavo means he is coming. All right. So again, that's why Lamed Aleph is not really its own Gizra, because it doesn't change things that dramatically much. It just changes that one, um, one little vowel here and there. But that is how the two hybridize. So you will encounter roots that have, uh, you know, that have uh, different rad, you know, belong belong to multiple Gizrot, and uh, so they will uh, hybridize in in certain uh, sometimes unique ways. So that is Bo. And if you want to practice um, some more uh, I and Vav conjugation, I don't have this on the vocabulary sheet, but a, a word you can use to do that is this one, Shin Vav Bait. And that is a word that means to return. Okay, so... Just to give you a little pre-hint, the third person masculine singular in the past tense of this would be shav. Okay? So past tense, third person masculine singular, conjugation of to return is shav. He returned is shav. All right? And if you want to um, Go further with that and just write out the different conjugations, attach the corresponding pronouns. That would be a great exercise uh, for remembering how this all works and kind of getting into the swing of things. And just a, a note, shuv is a very prevalent word in the scriptures. Okay, You may have heard of the term teshuva or tshuva, if you uh, speak it very quickly. All right, tshuva. Teshuva means repentance comes from shuv, right? Shuv is the root there. And uh, so it gives the context of the idea of repentance is turning around, going a different direction. Or returning home, another way of looking at it. So. So that's it for today, those three conjunctions and a few extra vocabulary words and then our I and Vav uh, conjugation. So next week we'll be digging, or not next week, but um, in three weeks, because the next two we'll have off again, we'll be digging a little deeper into these things, and um, we're very close, very close, and when we return we'll be even closer to actually translating a few verses. So that's very exciting. I hope to see you all then. Till then, shalom, and enjoy studying your Hebrew.